orange uh, prayer bracelets rocking this morning. And I got a fancy one that my daughter made me. The missionettes uh, are selling uh, these, these fancy, cool jump-in bracelets downstairs in the coffee bar. Uh, they want to do their part for our new building. And uh, bless you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be reading out of verse 14 this morning. Uh, while you're finding your way there... It's a great joy this morning to welcome 47 new members into our congregation. Uh, we, had a, we had a membership class a little over two weeks ago, and so 47. Now, all of their names are printed in the bulletin. You know, I can't even... Uh, I can't, it's like, it's like the roll call at our annual business meeting a couple of years ago. So uh, if you are one of the new members, we've, we had some last night at 5.30, this morning at 8.30, but if you are one of the new members whose names are in the bulletin there, I want to ask you to just stand and remain standing all over the sanctuary, if you would, please. If you're one of our new members, stand up all over this place. Anyway, stay standing, stay standing. Stay, remain standing for just one moment, if you would, please. God bless you. We welcome you today. And uh, I want you to stretch your hands towards these new members. And uh, if you're sitting near one of them, I want you to bless them and welcome them into our church family today. Let's give thanks. Father, we thank you so much that you love Harvest Time Church so much that, Lord, you've sent us the very best. Thank you that you sent us the cream of the crop. We thank you for these men and women. Thank you for these families, Lord, that you've called to be uh, uh, officially members in this church family. Lord, we welcome them. We open our arms. We extend to them today the right hand of fellowship and Father. We bless them, Lord, for meaningful friendships here in this body. We pray that they would find lifelong friends, Lord, with whom bonds of love and relationship would develop, Lord, friends, friendships that are encouraging, that are inspiring, that are challenging. Father, we bless them for meaningful service to your kingdom here in our body. Pray that you'd help each one of them to discover the gifts that you've deposited in them and grow in those giftings. Lord, pray that each one would take hold of that for which you've taken hold of them. Lord, we bless them in every way for your joy, for your health, for your prosperity, Lord, for your peace in all things. And we thank you so much for these new members. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Come on, give them one more, one more hand. God bless you. You know, we're talking all about phase two right now, and we're leading up to a Commitment Sunday two weeks from today, but why are we talking about a big building expansion at such a time as this in the world? You know, a lot of people are feeling very uncertain about the economy right now. A lot of people are feeling uncertain about the future of our country. Our society is slipping away from Christian values, Christian faith. Our moral convictions out of the Bible are putting us in the minority of society now. So why would we be trying to expand the church when it seems like culture is moving away from us? The answer is because the world needs the church more than ever before. America needs the church more than ever before. New York needs the church more than ever before. Westchester and Fairfield counties need the church more than ever before. Greenwich needs the church more than ever before. Families, marriages, parents, students, kids, young adults. What a great testimony from Brett who came and found his way to Harvest Time, found the Lord in our Alpha course. Now he's in the Bible study for men on Mondays called Clean and Growing in the Lord. Young adults need the church more than ever before. Not so young adults need the church more than ever before. We'll leave it there, all right? <laughs> you know, if you look at the 100-year history of our denomination, the greatest periods of expansion have been during the worst times. They've been during the worst economic times, the, uh, during times of war and social unrest. It seems that God loves working during famines. One of the greatest periods of Pentecostal expansion was during the Great Depression of the 1930s and leading up to World War II. Every one of our Bible colleges was built during that time. Our denomination's headquarters was built during that time. Our missions arm exploded during that time. 
A couple weeks ago, we talked about what if we hadn't built phase one? Well, think about it. What if the pastors and the deacons and the saints back then had decided not to build? What if they had decided just to circle the wagons and wait for Jesus to come back? You know, they believed that Jesus' return was way more imminent than we believe today. What if they had decided, let's just play it safe. Let's not take these huge faith risks. Let's not make these huge sacrifices. You know, there wouldn't have been a church for me to come and and find Jesus in. There wouldn't have been a church for me to grow up in. There wouldn't have been a Pentecostal Bible college and a Pentecostal seminary for me to train for ministry in. I might have ended up a Baptist. Jesus, help the church. Another period of amazing expansion was during the late 60s and into the 70s. Sexual revolution was going on, drug culture exploded, Cold War, Vietnam, the economy went into the tank, interest rates went up to 20%. Some of you remember those days. And what if the pastors and the deacons and the saints then decided not to keep pushing the kingdom of God forward? What if they had decided not to build buildings and plant churches? What if they had concluded, what's the point? Do you know, harvest time wouldn't be here then. There was a group of people, while Jimmy Carter was president and interest rates were 20%, there was a, a group of faithful believers who sacrificed and gave to a church planting fund. That money was sent from Sturbridge, Massachusetts to Greenwich, and that's how harvest time got here. What if they hadn't given? One of our new members this morning, John, is a student at the Alliance Theological Seminary over in Nyack. He invited me on Wednesday to go over and hear him preach his senior sermon in chapel, and he did a great job. I was really proud of him. But my heart was so blessed to see all those young men and young women who have devoted their lives for the work of the gospel. What will they do if churches like ours don't keep building now? Somewhere out there is the next pastor of harvest time. He or she may be in seminary right now. They may be in seventh grade. They may be in preschool. I hope it's preschool. (laughs) But what will the next pastor, what will the next board, what will the next congregation do if we don't sacrifice and build phase two today? Looking at those seminary students, I felt excited to think that someone will be coming along behind us to harvest what we plowed and planted. Even as we're harvesting today what someone else sowed yesterday, I relish the thought that the next pastor of this church will not have to work as hard on buildings as I have had to work. It makes me happy to think that he'll be able to focus 100% on preaching the word and caring for the flock and raising up leaders and discipling the people of God. Beloved, I want to tell you that phase two is a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This is it. This moment has been 30 years in the making for our congregation. Denise and I have been working towards this since 1997. And if you believe in our church, we're asking you to dig in deep and help us to get phase two out of the ground starting next summer. In two weeks, there's going to be a Commitment Sunday. Our friend Alvin Slaughter is going to be with us. It's going to be a really great day, a fun day. But we're asking you, take that devotional home. It begins tomorrow. And let's all get on the same page, reading and praying around the same things and ask God what he wants to do through us. Why build phase two? Because the world needs us. Greenwich needs us more than ever before. In Matthew 5, 14, your Bibles are open there. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your beauty on display. And glorify your Father in heaven. Looking at the words of Jesus here in Matthew 5, I I find six things that light means to the world. And I want to go as fast as I can. Six things that light means to the world. First of all, light means that we have a divine mission in the world. 
Light means that we have a divine mission in the world. When Jesus says you are the light of the world, the you in Greek is emphatic. What it means is you and you alone are the light of the world. Who is you? You is believers in Jesus. Lovers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. You is the church of Jesus Christ, his body around the world. You is us. You is harvest time. Harvest time, you have a mission in the world. Light means that the world is darkness. For Jesus to say that we alone, his church, are the light, implies that the rest of the world is in darkness. And in fact, Jesus said explicitly in John 3 that it is. The condition of the world is spiritual ignorance. The condition of the world is moral depravity. The condition of the world is groping and stumbling, unable to find the true path that leads to peace and security and fulfillment and health. Light means that we are different now because of Jesus. Jesus is saying, you are not the same as the world. You are distinct. You are different. They are dark, but you are light. You know, it wasn't always that way. We, too, were once dark, but we have undergone a transformation because of Jesus. Light means that we now have received life from above. The light that we have is not our own. It's been given to us by Jesus. Paul said, you were once darkness, but now you have become light in the Lord. So live as children of the light. Light means that we are absolutely unique in the world. Look at your neighbor and say, there is nothing like you. <laughs> there is nothing else like us. Beloved, look at me. Listen, get this in your spirit. We are unlike anything else. We are unlike any other group. We are unlike any other club. We are unlike any other institution. We are unlike any other religious body. Muslims are not like us. Hindus are not like us. Buddhists are not like us. New Agers, animists, they are not like us. Jesus said, you, you who? The church of Jesus Christ, you and you alone are the light of the world. Light means that we're absolutely vital in the world. Whether the world knows it or not, they need us. They need what we bring to the table. They need what we bring to society. We are infinitely valuable. Light means, listen, that Jesus has called us to give our whole lives away for his sake. In Matthew 5, Jesus actually says we're both salt and light. And salt and light have one thing in common. They give themselves away. They expend themselves. You know, the flame consumes the very wick that sustains it. The, the burning lamp consumes the very oil that gives it life. In the same way, God's light means that our lives become consumed with bringing him glory until it is all expended, until it is all given away. And that's good preaching. Six things that light means to the world. Light means that we have a mission. Number two, light means that only we manifest the living presence of Jesus in the world. Uh, when Jesus said to his audience, you are the light of the world, to the Jewish thinker, it immediately brought many different associations about light. To the Jewish people, light symbolized God's presence with his people. It reminded them of the pillar of fire in the wilderness that traveled with them. It reminded them of the glory cloud that filled Solomon's temple. Listen, Christmas is right around the corner. Christmas decorations have been out since September, but it's actually coming now. And you're going to see lights everywhere. Let every one of those little lights remind you that God is with his people. When Jesus stood up in the temple and he said, I am the light of the world, what Jesus was saying is, I was that pillar of fire. I was that glory cloud that filled the house so that the priest couldn't stand up and minister. I am the living manifestation of God's presence in the world. When he left the world, he said, now you are the light of the world. That means that the church is where Jesus' living presence can be found on earth. 
when we gather together for worship, his, do you feel his presence here this morning while we were worshiping? It was awesome. Jesus said, we're two or three or four or more of you throw a party in my name, I'm there. I got to tell you, we had such a time on Friday evening praying fire in the night. The power of God in this place Friday evening. Jesus' living presence was here with us. If you weren't able to make it, I want you to know you were prayed for Friday night like you have never been prayed for. God is going to send angels of provision to every house that calls this church their home. But his living presence, it's only found on earth through the church, through the church's preaching, through the church's ministries, through the church's prayers. In fact, listen, now Saturday night they stiffened up when I said this, but I'm not a heretic. Listen, it is only possible to find the living presence of Jesus on earth with the church playing a vital role. I believe that it was the intercession of the church in Jerusalem in Acts 2 and in Acts 4, I believe that it was the preaching of Stephen and his intercession while he was being martyred that caused Saul to have the encounter on the Damascus road that he had. And after he had the encounter with the living presence of Jesus, Saul needed a follow-up visit from the church to interpret that encounter that he had, to confirm the encounter that he had, to complete the encounter that he had. Listen to me, beloved. Whether you receive Jesus inside a church or whether you receive Jesus outside of the church, the church had a vital role whether you knew it or not. And you need the church to interpret and to confirm and to complete your journey. Six things that light means in the world. Number three... Light means that only we reveal the eternal truth in the world. Only we reveal the eternal truth in the world. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth, to God's truth. He did that through his teaching. He did that through his miracles. He did that through his life of sinless perfection. He did that through his death and his bodily resurrection. And bearing witness to the truth brought Jesus into conflict with the world. It brought him into conflict with culture and with religion and with governments. Beloved, God's truth confronts darkness. It challenges the darkness. John wrote, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness can't overcome it. You and you alone are the light of the world means that Jesus has now passed on to us that duty of bearing witness to the truth. Only we can teach the world what Jesus taught. Only we can do the miraculous works of Jesus in his name. Only we can be Christ-like in our nature and in our character. Only we can do it. I was watching a debate on gay marriage on television a little while back ago and there was a Christian and there were a couple of other people at a round table and things started getting heated and one of the men became really angry with the Christian and he quipped, you don't have a corner on the market on the truth. Actually, the Bible does have the corner on the market on truth. <laughs> Beloved, a lot of times when believers speak God's truth, the world immediately accuses us of being judgmental. How many of you have had that one thrown at you? Listen, only God can judge. Judge not, lest ye be judged. That is the most misquoted verse in the entire Bible. Listen, don't fall for that. We are not judging. We are bearing witness to the truth. We're teaching what Jesus taught. We're saying what God has said in his word. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Jesus warned us that this duty of bearing witness to the truth would absolutely bring us into conflict with culture, with religions, with governments. But he said we can't hide our light. In spite of the conflict, we have to let the light shine anyway. Beloved, listen to me. Our light is useful. Our light is helpful. It gives clarity. It gives perspective. Jesus said, 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not stumble around in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. Our light is desperately needed in the world more than ever before. Maybe you heard that in the last week or two, the American Psychiatric Association released a new journal and they have now classified pedophilia, pedophilia as a sexual orientation, <laughs> legitimizing sex between adults and minors. There was such an outcry from the American Family Association that they backed down and they came out with a statement last week and they said, oops, it was a typo. Listen, it wasn't a typo, it's an agenda. And the world needs the light of the church to stand up and say, no, that is not right. That is not healthy, that is not normal, that is not good. It is iniquity, and it's something that the blood of Jesus can cleanse out of the heart of a man and a woman and restore them and make them whole. The light of revelation is only found through the church. That's why you need to be in church. Beloved, listen to me. Everybody look at me. Walking on the beach and thinking lofty thoughts about God. You know, that's a, that's a wonderful thing to do. I would tell you it's even a necessary thing to do. But it can never, ever take the place of participating in church. You need the light of revelation that only comes through the ministries of the church. You see, when we gather together in the name of Jesus, there is an atmosphere of anointing. There is an atmosphere of authority. And you need to receive revelation in that atmosphere. See, walking, walking on the beach, you can self-select what revelation you'd like to think upon. But in church, you'll be introduced to truth that your mind would have never wandered to on its own. You'll be confronted with truths that you'd rather not think about, but you need to hear. We all need to hear it. Six things that light means in the world. Got to hurry. Number four, light means that God wants to display our beauty in the world. Light means that God wants to display our beauty in the world. To the Jewish people, light was a symbol of purity. And Jesus wants to see, uh, wants the world to see the pure beauty of Christ in us, the hope of glory. He wants the world to see the beauty of a transformed life, the beauty of a transformed inner nature. He wants the world to see the beauty of a transformed moral character. He wants the world to see the beauty of a healed and restored life, the, the beauty of a person who has now received a spirit of power and love and a sound mind, who has stable emotions and who has a, a sound mind and a yielded will. He, he wants the world to see the beauty of healed and restored relationships. Jesus said, let your good deeds shine. Interesting words there. The word good is actually the word kalos. It's actually the word beautiful. And it really means ethical purity. So in context of the beatitudes that come before these verses and the inner righteousness of the kingdom that follows these verses, what Jesus means here when he says, let your good deeds shine, he means something more than just good works. He means let your goodness shine. Beautiful deeds is our entire life in Jesus. It's everything we are. It's everything that we do because Christ is in us and we are in Christ. Let the beauty of Christ in you, the hope of glory, shine in the world. Let the beauty of Christ in his church shine in the world so that all men might see and give glory to our Father in heaven. To him be glory in the church throughout all generations forever and ever. Listen, our display of pure beauty will bring mixed reactions in the world. Some people will be drawn toward our light. Some will love the light, but others will recoil from it. Jesus said, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of the light. Because their deeds were evil, they hate the light. They refuse to come into the light because their deeds are exposed. 
You see, the pure life of Jesus created a dilemma in the world. It exposed the deficiency of everyone else. Jesus made people feel what they couldn't feel before, their sin, their imperfection, their impurity. He, he became the standard, so he removed the possibility of us feeling good about ourselves by comparing ourselves. Well, you know, compared to an axe murderer, I'm not that bad. But when Jesus showed up, he, he showed up everybody. And as the beauty of Christ in us shines in the world, we inadvertently expose people's fallenness too. And they don't appreciate us for it. That's why Paul said everyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But listen to me, beloved. Jesus said in spite of that, don't put your light under a lid. Let it shine. Six things light means for the world. Number five. Light means that we are shining examples of things to come. Light comes from above. If you don't get the picture of the gold box on the globe, go to Pastor Nick's class on Wednesday. It's called Things to Come, and you'll understand what that means. Light comes from above. It speaks of another place. It speaks of another kingdom. It speaks of another realm, uh, of another world. Jesus said, no one on earth has seen the things that I have seen, but I've come down from heaven to tell you about them. Now Jesus has passed to us, his church, that duty to testify of things to come. You see, our unique community that is unlike anything else in the world, it testifies of things to come. Our unique body life, our unique government, our unique unity, uh, our unique serving one another in humility. Beloved, can I tell you, Harvest Time Church is absolutely unique in Greenwich. There isn't another congregation that is as diverse as this congregation is. People from all walks of life, from all around the country, from all around the world gathered here together. It is something extraordinary. It is something special. And they take note of it. The unique atmosphere that envelops all of our gatherings testifies to the authority of King Jesus, to the goodness and the order of heaven. Our uniqueness testifies to a coming age when the whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. We testify that there is coming one day a new Jerusalem, the city of the living God. We testify that there are thousands and thousands of angels worshiping God in joyful assembly. We testify that there is a book in heaven with names written in it. We testify that one day the spirits of righteous men will be made perfect through the blood of Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. We testify that one day God will judge all men. We testify that one day it's shall be on earth as it is in heaven. We are a microcosm when we get together of what will be everywhere on earth someday. We give the world a glimpse of things to come. Six things that light means to the world. Number six, and I'm done. Worship team, come and help me. Look at me because you're going to get encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Here's one more thing that light means. Light means that God has strategically placed us right here, right now. You and you alone are the light of the world. When you consider the audience that Jesus was addressing, they must have thought that he was joking. Really, Jesus? Us? We're the ones who are going to do this? He was speaking, this is early in his ministry, he's in Galilee, he's speaking to a group of Galilean peasants. He's speaking to the hillbillies of Israel. These were not the movers and shakers. These were not the power brokers. These were not the beautiful people. These were not the winners. They had a saying in Israel, can anything good come from Nazareth? When Jesus said to this little group, you and you alone are the light of the world, they must have thought, us, Jesus? This eclectic crew of average Joes and plain James, people with sketchy past, people with unpromising futures. Jesus, you've entrusted this duty to us? 
to introduce people to the presence of a living God, to teach the truth boldly, like we have the corner on the market on it, to model inner beauty and inner purity, to testify of glorious things to come. You've entrusted this duty to us, and we're all you've got. You don't have a, a backup plan. God, that's not very good planning for the creator of the universe. But Jesus had complete confidence in that ragtag bunch. You can do this, and only you. Around the middle of this last week, I asked the Lord for an encouraging word. And as I was studying Matthew 5, 16, I read this. Listen, the light is placed strategically so that it can shine to its best advantage. And God does the placing. We are simply to shine where he has placed us. Here's the encouraging word that God gave me that I now give to you. God has placed us right here, right now. God has strategically set us on this hill. He has strategically set us on this lampstand. God set harvest time here in Greenwich. God sent me and my wife here in 1996. God brought you here, and we're so grateful and so thankful that he has. God has put us here together. When Nehemiah set out to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, the infidels laughed him to scorn. What are those feeble people trying to build now? Do they really think that they can finish it? with the little that they have to work with. It's so flimsy that a stiff breeze could knock it over. It's so flimsy that a, a little fox could knock down their wall. You know, looking at our little church trying to build phase two, some people feel the same way. What are they going to do? What, what's this little group going to do? Such big aspirations, such big plans. But God gave me an encouraging word. He has strategically placed us here. And he has complete confidence in us. You are the light of Greenwich. You are the light of Fairfield County. You are the light of Westchester County. You are the light of New York City. You are the light of the world. So let's shine so that all men will see the beauty of Christ in his church and give glory to God the Father. Stand on your feet right now, if you would, and I want you to give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this house. Oh, come on, I know we can do better. Let's give Jesus a big praise. Come on, let's give him glory. Lift up a shout. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We're going to sing and then we're going to prepare to receive the Lord's table as our final act of worship this morning. But I want to tell you real quickly about a dream that I've had over and over and over again. Going back to 1999, every dream that I have ever had about our church has been in the phase two building. There's only one time that I had a dream in phase one, and that was a week before the Greenwich outpouring started on Mother's Day of last year. Only dream I ever had in phase one. Every other dream has been in phase two, and one that I've had most frequently has been this. Seeing the phase two building from the outside, the darkness of the night keeps getting blacker and blacker and blacker thick it, it, it has like it's murky it has like a, a texture like a consistency to it and it keeps getting like ink blacker and blacker and I keep seeing light inside the phase two building and the light inside the building keeps getting brighter and brighter. It, the, the color of the light is, is like not an earthly color of light. It's not like the, the color of these golden lights. It's, it's a white, bright 
light that's luminescent and it keeps growing brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. Why are we doing this? Why build this new building? Because the world needs us. Greenwich needs us more than ever before. Come on, lift up your hands, lift up your faces. Sing with me, light of the world, you step down into darkness. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this high. give him a little praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for the broken body of our Lord. Father, we thank you that you so loved us that you gave Jesus your only son. Thank you that his body was broken so that we might be made whole in every way. Whole in our spirit. Whole in our soul whole in our thinking, whole in our emotions, whole in our decision making, whole in our relationships, whole in our physical bodies. Father, we thank you that his body was broken so that we who were not a people might now be gathered together as the people of God, the church of Jesus, the light of the world. Father, I pray that as we receive this bread this morning, that you would release in our midst the beautiful unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. Father, I pray that you would make us one, even as the Father and the Son are one, as we partake together of the one loaf, Jesus. We ask you in his mighty name, and everyone said, amen. Let's receive the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, this is the, my third time sharing communion this weekend, and every time we receive the bread, I've just felt like this little wind of the Holy Spirit. I just, I feel like uh, the Lord just wants to release a little healing right now. You know, the Bible says that I am the God that healeth thee. I sent my word and healed your disease. Healing is the children's bread. And this is what I feel in my spirit. God not only wants to heal people in this house, but I think he wants to release healing to someone that we love right now. The Roman centurion understood that Jesus could stand wherever he was and release a word of healing. And then across the miles, someone would receive a touch. And so if you need a healing in your body, I want you to lift up your hand. If, if you want to just ask God right now for a healing for someone that you love, we're just going to pray that God is just going to release healing grace right now. Father, thank you right now that you heal our diseases. Lord, that the price of our peace was laid on Jesus, that by his stripes we are healed. Father, right now I pray that you'd release healing virtue in this house, Lord. I pray that you'd heal bones, Lord. I pray that you'd heal joints, Lord. I pray, Lord, that there would be creative miracles and that you'd re restore cartilage, Lord God, and that, Father, you would just move right now and just repair damage that has been done. I pray for an alignment, Lord, of hips and spines, of shoulders, Lord, of uh, back and neck in the name of Jesus. I pray for a healing of skin disorders right now, of bloodborne illnesses, of diseases. Father, we release right now a word of healing, Father. Father, we release it across the miles to people that we love. We stand and proxy for them. Father, I pray that you'd send healing miracles, Lord, to, to bedrooms right now where people are sick in bed, to living room sofas where people are lying in pain right now. Father, I pray if somebody's watching 
uh, on live stream, and I thank you for releasing a, a miracle of healing right now. There's someone who's watching on the live stream. Father, in Jesus' name, to hospital beds right now, I pray, Lord, that uh, from this house, a declaration in the heavenly realm of healing would be released right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Paul continues, in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you, the light of the world, proclaim his death until he comes. Let's give thanks. Father, now we thank you that we have been redeemed, not by perishable things like gold or silver, but by the precious blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Father, thank you for your promise that says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right now, we receive your washing. By faith in the cross of Christ, we receive everything purchased for us on Calvary. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Let's receive the cup. Thank you, O oh Lord. 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 I have to tell you, I just feel a little party in my spirit. And uh, if we had phase two, we could stay and we could do something about that. But we don't have phase two, so you have to go. The ushers are going to pass containers down your row. Put your empty communion cup in the container as it goes by you. Come on, sing one more time, Christ alone. In Christ alone, in cornerstone alone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, everyone. Take somebody's hand next to you. There's white lines on the grass. Go walk phase two. Take your devotional home. Uh, start tomorrow and for the next 14 days, let's just be on the same page. And Tuesday night, Tom Demery is going to be here uh, walking from Boston to New York, praying that God will just uh, rekindle the, the fires of revival that came to our nation from New England. And I told the Lord Friday night, I went in on that. So uh, Lord, just put us in on the IPO, the initial public outpouring of that. Father, thank you now for this time in your presence. God, go with your people. Let the cloud of your presence envelop us. Lord, let your protection surround us. Let your provision accompany us. Let your providence lead us. And your peace encircle us until we come together again. And everyone said, amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great week in Jesus. Let's praise the King of Kings and the